Hey students, this is Matthew Wynn with FAU. Today we're going to be going over a discounted cash flow analysis based on a case that I came up with. We're going to take into account forecasting all three financial statements. We're going to do a free cash flow. We're going to do a WAC analysis. We're going to solve for WAC. We're going to get a business valuation by then applying the WAC to our discounted cash flow analysis of our free cash flows. Let's get started and let's jump right into the case and let's get it done. We're going to go from A to Z so you guys are prepared for solving for a business valuation by doing a discounted cash flow. Alrighty, everyone, we're going to keep this super candid. Let's jump into the other screen real quick. So let's read through this case. I'll give you guys a second. And if you guys are watching this video, you most likely already have this case. So case study on EV fire blankets, EV fire blankets, specialized car fire blankets. Introduction. EV Fire Blankets is a customized uh, company specializing in the production of specialized car blankets designed for fire safety and vehicles. Given increased awareness and regulations surrounding fire safety and automobiles, the company is looking to secure additional funding for expansion and product development. EV Fire Blankets have established itself as a reputable player in the automotive uh, safety industry. The company's specialized car blankets have been well received by consumers and are designed to effectively mitigate fire risks in vehicles. EV Fire Blankets operates uh, with strong commitment to innovation and safety standards. As a financial analyst, your role is to conduct a DCF for this company. To proceed with the DCF analysis, we need to gather specific financial data, including revenue projections, operating expenses, capital expenditure forecasts. Additionally, we should focus on market growth, competition, potential risks with specialized car blanket industries. Once we have this, we'll calculate the percentage of the company that has to be offered to investors and develop a comprehensive financial investment proposal. If you have any additional details or specific financial data related to EV fire blankets, please provide them. We can delve deeper into the analysis and determine the optimal investment options for the company's expansion. All right, a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo. In totality, what we need to do is we need to do a free cash flow forecast and get our discounted cash flow. And we'll do a valuation on the EBITDA multiple method, and then we'll do the perpetuity growth method. So we got an email from our CFO. Fantastic. Hey, analyst, I hope your week is going well. I'm sending you the request from Miss Atlantic, our CFO. Let's assume we are in the beginning of 2023 for the forecast period. We have another analyst on this project that was able to compile some of the information in the Excel file attached, and you'll see the assumptions listed on the assumptions tab. The following steps we'd like you to complete. Finalize the projected income, balance sheet, and cash flows. Use a mix of historicals and ratios to find the missing line items. Find our WAC and our EV to EBITDA multiple based on market research and then comparable company data provided as well. You can use the links attached to find the cost of debt and cost of equity as well as the weights for each. Forecast the free cash flows. Perform a discounted cash flow analysis. Use perpetuity growth method and EBITDA multiple method to get evaluation. The assumptions will be attached to the Excel sheet. Additions to PP&E along with depreciation assumptions are given and long-term debt assumptions are given as well. In this case, let's assume we do not have to pay back our debt in the forecast period. Common stock won't change. We can also assume that other current assets and other current liabilities won't change as well. The end goal. We want to get a valuation of the company, determine at the investment dollars, what would the investor get with regards to stake in the EV fire blanket company. You need to determine our enterprise value first. I'm attaching the spreadsheet below with some historical financials. Thank you. All right, let's get started. So I have the assumptions pulled up here on our case. So on a brief look, let's take a look at all of the stuff that we have here. We have the project assumptions. We have to solve for the WAC. We'll have to solve for the EBITDA multiple. Uh, multiple. The perpetuity growth rate is given. That's an assumption. So we're going to say that after X amount of years, we're going to grow in perpetuity at 3%. The perpetuity multiple we will also solve for once we get our WAC. Our tax rate is 21%, and our target debt to equity is 15%. That's given as well. All right, so let's just take a quick look around to see what we have going on here, guys. Uh, let's look at the income statement. We have the historical income statement here. We also have the balance sheet plus the cash flows. So we have our cash flows there, and we have our, um, we have our balance sheet. I will change this to one color. All right, we found our first hiccup. Comparable comps, so they gave us a bunch of stuff. So let's take a look at this. Uh, after we do our income statement, balance sheet, and uh, regular cash flows. 
So I'll walk you guys through how to get the the relevered beta, um, the EBITDA multiples, and these are the comparable companies we decided to use. Honeywell, Johnson Controls, RTX Corp. And it looks like we have some of the data pulled up here, um, and we have all of the data here for the stock market. Okay. Our free cash flows, we have it semi-built out. We have our historicals, and then we have our discounted cash flow dashboard where we'll fill in the blanks to get the information provided here. Okay, so let's start with our income statement. We know that we have sales, cost of goods sold, gross profit, R&D, SGA, and travel entertainment. Let's take a look and do this quickly. So we have some historical assumptions here, but it looks like they've given us what they want us to forecast of. So let's just do the sales real quick. So when we go here, we know that our sales are going to grow by one plus the growth rate here. So the growth rate is 20%. Let's copy this. So we know that we're going to multiply D8. And if we pull this over, it should work out nicely. Okay, cool. Everything looks good there. Let's do the same for cost of goods sold. So our cost of goods sold is going to be a percentage of our uh, sales. So it will be 20% of sales. Let's lock down the column here. I mean, the row, I apologies. That way we can just pull this over. Let's also lock down. Actually, nope, we're good here. So let's pull this over. All right, all right, we're getting somewhere. Now, gross profit is just equal to our sales minus our COGS. So we'll multiply that or subtract that. We'll pull that over. All right, SGA. Let's copy this. Let's see if this works. All right, it's looking good. And we should be able to pull this down. Uh, it looks like we're off by one. Looks like we're off by one. Okay. So what we'll do here is we'll go back. It should be should be F sixteen. So we'll just change this to F16. We'll pull this down. We're lock, we locked that the sales number. So that should be good. Pull this over. All right, our total operating expenses. Let's do a sum of all these. Let's copy. Paste that. Let's get our earnings before interest taxes and depreciation and amortization. So we'll take our gross profit, subtract that out from our OPEX. Let's pull this over. Okay, everything's looking good. Everything's looking good. Okay, so our depreciation in this case, let's take the assumption they gave us. They gave us our depreciation expense. So let's pull this over. Okay, looking good. Let's get our EBIT. Looks like they already have it calculated here, but I'm just going to do it anyway. So we'll do this minus this. Let's pull this over. We know our tax rate is not going to change, so let's just multiply this by our tax rate. Let's lock that tax rate in. Pull this out. And then it should just be this minus this. Okay, perfect. All right, looking good. Income statement is done. Let's look at the balance sheet. Okay, balance sheet. So our cash, we'll, we're going to solve for that later. Our accounts receivable, there's a note here. Uh, so let's copy this actually and put it on our assumptions page. So we'll take our days in AR. So what are we going to do? We're going to take uh, accounts receivable. We'll take the ending balance. You can either do an average of the ending balance. We'll take the ending balance, divide this by our sales, divided by 365. Should give us our, oops, why is it complaining? Oh, there's an extra one here. So we get 109, and I think I should be able to pull that over. 
Okay, let's do our days in inventory. So we'll take our inventory, ending inventory. We'll divide that by our cogs. Divided by 365. Okay, so we got our days in inventory. Let me clean up these decimal points so they're all cohesive. So da, da, da. Okay, two decimal places is good. Let's do the same thing with our payables. So let's go to our uh, balance sheet. Let's get our accounts payable. Let's divide that by our, our COGS. Oops. Our COGS again. Divided by 365. Let's get these days. Okay. So let's format this. Let's get our cash conversion cycle because why not? So do, do, and then plus or minus C32. All right, we got our cash conversion cycle, and I'm actually going to take this and paste it back because what we are doing here is we are, um, or actually, I'm just going to delete this out of here. Clear contents. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so for our accounts receivable, go back to assumptions. Let's get an average here. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply these ratios to our, our sales numbers to give us a accurate picture on how we can forecast these line items rather than just doing them as a percentage. We're going to forecast them based on the average. So since we already did the sales, now what we have to do is we have to do, to find our AR, we have to do our sales divided by 365 and multiply them by the number of days. All right, so let's do that. All right, so our AR, let's do our, our sales. So let's go back here, income statement. Let's go to sales. Let's parentheses here. Divided by 365. And then let's multiply this by our days. Let's lock this down. This will be our ratio factor here. That'll get us our forecasted AR. So let's do this. Looking good, looking good. All right, let's do our inventory next. So inventory is going to be uh, our, uh, we'll go to our COGS. Divided by 365, throw this in parentheses. Multiply this by average days. Multiply this by average days. Okay, that looks good. Oops, I forgot to lock it. Let's lock this down. Okay, looking good, looking good. Uh, let's go to our accounts payable. So we're going to do the same thing. Let's do our COGS. Divided by 365. And there's probably a faster way of doing this. I just want to show you guys what I'm exactly doing. Could probably just uh, make some mixed references and then be able to complete that um, that way. So we'll do that. Da, 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 da. We'll multiply this by our average days payable here. Looking fantastic. We'll pull this out. Okay. Per oops, I forgot to lock it again. So we'll lock this. And we will pull this over. All right, so what's next? We know our other current assets are going to remain the same based on the case, so let's just do this. Let's copy this over. Same thing with our other current liabilities. So let's take this and let's copy it over. That's interesting. They're both the same number. All right, so da, 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 what's next? Okay. Uh, current liabilities, let's just do this real quick. So it's going to be the sum of this. This is like a mini balance sheet. There's obviously in practice going to be a lot more numbers, but we're trying to get this done quickly and effectively to show you guys how to do things. So you can um, apply this for when you are 
doing your thing. So let's copy this over. We don't have cash yet. We're going to wait to do our cash flows for that. All right, PPE. Looks like we have additions on our assumptions. So let's just add this to our PPE assumptions. We're going to go up, or CapEx, same thing. Um, we're assuming that CapEx is going to be the only um, additions they have. And we know that our accumulated depreciation is going to be um, it's just going to be this plus the depreciation assumptions. So quick tangent in practice, uh, the best way to do this is to create your own depreciation schedule and um, have your total assets and then any purchases you're going to buy and then depreciate them and then come up with a schedule. The same thing with loan and loan payments. In this case, we're not doing that. Um, so we'll take the net of these, the net of these, Okay, so kind of similar um, for for loans. So what you'll do for loans in, in practice, most likely, unless it's a, a quick and dirty or it's a newer company, is you'll have a, a loan schedule and you'll apply that to your financial statements. But in this case, we're going to make it, we're going to teach you guys the, uh, the model mechanics and then we will move on into um, actually how to do the valuation. Um, so... Let's do it. All right. Accounts payable. We have our current liabilities. Our long-term debt is going to be increased the same way. Looks like we got a little, a nice little debt here um, where we're not going to have, um, we're not going to have any, any interest. So looks good to me. I like that. So our debt will stay the same. Uh, total liabilities. We'll take our current liabilities. Add that to our our long-term liabilities look good, look good. It said common stock is going to remain the same. We're not paying any dividends. So uh, our retained earnings is just going to be our last year retained earnings plus the net income for that year. Okay, that looks good. All right. Let's add these together. This plus this. Looking good, looking good. All right. So, uh, looks like we're out of whack by 10,000. So, uh, basically, this is just a little formula to check if it's okay or not okay, uh, if, there's, if there's a balance here. So, Let's take a look at our cash flows now. So let's go to our cash flows. Let's do our net income. So we'll take our net income from that year. We will add back our depreciation for that year. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, let's just pull this over. Let's, oops, let's take our depreciation from our income statement. And then let's find our changes in working capital. So this is going to be the good, the fun stuff. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our uh, net working capital. So let's take our prior year. So we'll do the sum of sum of the prior year. So we'll do our sum of our AR and our inventory. Or we could just do this. Boom. Minus our current liabilities. All right. And then we'll subtract that out from this year's sum of current assets. Minus, minus our current liabilities. That should get us the change in our net working capital. All right, let's pull this over. All right, so cash flow from operations. Let's pull this over. Looking good. Uh, we have zero common stock, so we can actually just zero this out. Or you can reference uh, the common stock, but that's fine. Issuance of debt, so we'll take our current debt amount 
subtracted out from our prior year to get our current debt. And remember, debt is going to increase our cash. So uh, when we issue debt, we're going to have more cash. All right. Payment of debt. We're not paying any debt. We're lucky. So like I said, if you had this, something like this in practice and you'd want to calculate your payments of debt, um, you will make a schedule where you do your debt and you pay the debt off and that will impact the, um, the cash flow. But for now, this is good. So we'll do a sum of this. And you would, and you would uh, decrease your cash flow as you pay debt off, obviously. Right? Okay. All right, let's take our CapEx. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the same thing. We're going to take our PP&E. This is going to be our only CapEx in this case. We're going to subtract it from our, our prior year. And we'll make this a negative since we know that's... So, you know, that's a deduction from cash flow. Pull this over. And because I like to be consistent, I'm going to take this. Um, I'm going to take this and I'm going to make it the same. We're not going to sell any PP&E. So, we'll do that. All right. And I think that's already built in. So, we'll just pull that over. Just a sum. Um, so we know our additions to cash is going to be the sum total of all this. So boom, boom, boom. Uh, we'll take our beginning balance, which would be last year's ending balance. And we'll do the sum of this and this. All right. And our cash should equal... Cash should equal this. All right, it balanced out. Good to go. Now, say our prayers and let's copy it over. So, let's copy this over. Let's copy this over. It should check out. All right, we balanced. Let's go. All right, so we got our three financial statements forecasted. Next is going to be doing a free cash flow. And then from there, we're going to go and do get our whack, and then we'll uh, find our discounted cash flow, and we'll get ready to close this thing out. All right, guys. So we're here at our free cash flows. We have our EBIT uh, from the income statement. We want to take out taxes, so we're going to go to the income statement, find the taxes for that year. We want to add back depreciation, so we can take that from the income statement here. We want to take out any capital expenditures. So we'll go to the balance sheet, balance sheet and we'll go to our CapEx. And then we will also take out any changes to network and capital. Go to our balance sheet again and cash flows. And our cash flows, we will take the changes in working capital. All right. So we're going to subtract out the taxes, add back depreciation, then add back those last two items of CapEx and the work change to working capital since they're already negative. So let's pull this over. We got our free cash flows. Now we have our discounted cash flow model. Um, from here, we're going to take our free cash flows and then we have to find a discounted value. So what can we do to get our discounted value? All right, guys. So next we want to go into our comparable companies and we want to find our WAC. The first thing we need to do is we need to find our weighted so debt to cap and then equity to cap is what we're going to do. So first what we need to do is we need to find our weights by doing one for each comparable company. So in this case, we're going to take our total debt and we're going to divide it by our total debt again, plus our uh, total enterprise value. Right. We're going to pull that down. And our total enterprise value is just our market cap plus our net debt, right? We're, we're, we're using our net debt. So that will give us our total enterprise value. And then we have our debt to equity, our uh, debt to uh, capitalization. And we can do the same here. So now we'll just do our total enterprise value divided by our total enterprise value plus our total debt. Or we can just do one minus to get us the same figure. 
All right. So let's pull this down. Now we want to get, uh, let's do the high, low, median, and, and then our average. So we'll do this. Let's copy this over. Let's change this. Uh, let's do this. So let's change this to this. And that is equal to, should be E, should be G. We'll change all this to percentages. All right, 19%, 91%. Let's add two decimal places. Let's, um, let's now lock this. Pull this down and let's change this to min. Let's change this to median. And let's change this to average, All right? Average. All right, looking good, looking good. Now let's go to this. Let's do the same. Let's lock this down. Let's lock that down. All right, let's pull this down and let's change this to min. Let's change this to, let's change this to median. And let's change this, oops. Let's change this to me, uh, average, right? Average. All right, now we got our weights here. Um, I think I have it set up so it pulls it up up here. So we have our two weights. Now let's get our relevered beta. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the beta from our uh, our market information, yeah, the market cash, the total total cash, and total debt, uh, total net debt, and then we have our um, our tax rate here again. So what we can do to get our delevered beta is we can take this formula, so it's going to be our normal beta divided by one plus one minus tax rate. And we're gonna multiply that by our total net debt divided by our market cap. So it's gonna be our total net debt divided by our market cap, right? Our market cap, so let's close this off. All right, looking good. So this is gonna be our delevered beta. I'll clear these contents. Okay, so now we have our, in, let's get our industry average. We're not gonna do the high and low in this case. We don't necessarily need the high and low, just doing, the, just doing that to show you guys some different perspectives. So we'll do this and then let's relever this beta. So what we can do for that formula is we're gonna do this which is our industry average delevered beta, we're gonna multiply it by one minus our tax rate. And then we'll multiply it again by our, by our, um, our target debt equity, right? Oops, I need to add the one plus here. All right, looking good, looking really good. All right, so what's next? Now we can calculate our cost of equity. So before that, I just wanna show you guys how to calculate the nominal risk-free rate. We're gonna use our real risk-free rate um, by using a treasury uh, bond, 10-year treasury bond from the government. But just to show you how to calculate the nominal risk-free rate, we can do this times this. So it'd be one plus the real, real risk-free rate, the current 10-year treasury one plus the inflation rate, minus one, right? Minus one, so we get 8%. You can find this on the links that I provided here. So I have the cost of debt taking into account a 10-year um, ICE Bank of America high yield index. That could be the cost of debt, cost of borrowing here, right, cost of borrowing. Um, next, for the current interest rate, we'll use the Fed Funds rate uh, for the 10 year real rate, we'll use the uh, 10 year uh, treasury yield from the government. We can find out this and we can find the inflation rate here. Uh, and then we can find the expected return here. So let's find the cost of equity. Cost of equity is going to be equal to our 
uh, risk-free rate, which we're going to use the 10-year treasury. We're going to multiply that by our beta or assume beta um, multiplied by our market risk premium, which is just our expected return minus our real uh, real risk-free rate or real risk rate. Multiply this, enter. Oops, I did something wrong here. We want to add this actually. So we get 10.41%. That looks good. Now let's get our WAC. So what we can do for our WAC is we can get our cost of debt, multiply that by one minus the tax rate for the tax benefit, right? And then we're going to multiply that by our weight of debt. So let's throw all this into parentheses. And let's add this to our cost of equity, which we can multiply that by our weight of the equity. So this is going to be our assumed whack. We'll come back to our assumptions page here, and then we'll pull in that EBITDA multiple, which we're going to get next, right? We're going to get next. All right. So let's get our EBITDA multiple. So we have our, EBITDA, our enterprise value in our EBITDA. So to get the multiples for each, we're just going to divide for each of these public companies, their enterprise value by their EBITDA. We're going to get these multiples. We're going to do the same here, high, low, and median. And average, we're going to use the average. But I just want to show you guys a possible way to use other, um, other metrics here. So let's lock this into place. So close down, change this to mid, change this to medium, and we'll change this to average. We're getting close, we're getting close. Okay, so one more concept. When you're doing a valuation of a private company in this case, there's something called an illiquidity premium. It's just a 30% assumption. So we're assuming that because this is a private company, it's not a public company like the stocks we analyzed or the companies we analyze. We're gonna take a 30% discount or illiquidity premium and attach that to the multiple. So our enterprise value multiple, uh, EV to EBITDA multiple is 17.09X as an average of the five companies we did an analysis on. We're gonna take 70% of that and say that's gonna be our multiple. So our EBITDA multiple will be 11.96X. And if you wanna see how you can do that here, just go to custom, go to more number formats and you can write it as a number format here. Um, just look at that. All right, next, let's do our perpetuity multiple. So our perpetuity multiple is gonna be equal to our uh, perpetuity growth rate. So one plus our perpetuity growth rate, which is given as an assumption, how much are we gonna grow into the future and divide that by our WAC minus, our WAC minus our perpetuity multiple. We should get 13.91x. All right, now that we're done with that, let's move on to our discounted cash flow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna discount our cash flows. Um, so our rate is gonna be our, our WAC. We'll lock this down. Our rate is going to be our, uh, our number of periods is gonna be the number of periods. We're gonna skip the payment and we're gonna do a negative of this. And we'll pull it over. Okay, let's get a sum of this. So that's our net present value of free cash flows. We can also do NPV. Rate again is going to be our WAC. And we'll take our free cash flows. And those should equal the same. All right, they're the same. Looking good. All right, net present value or free cash flows. It's going to be this. Our last forecasted cash flow will be our um, last forecasted free cash flow in gross. We'll multiply this by our terminal value. Our terminal value. So our terminal value multiple or perpetuity multiple is going to be this. And we're going to discount this. So present value. Our rate, again, is going to be our WAC probably could name this, but too deep in it now. Uh, number of periods is going to be five. Our payment's going to be nothing. And our future value is going to be this terminal value now. So that should get us our, our valuation using the perpetuity multiple method. Looking good. All right, let's do the EBITDA multiple method. So we'll take our last forecasted cash flow. Take our last forecasted EBITDA. And then for their terminal value, we're going to multiply this by our EBITDA multiple now. 
or even a multiple. You get that, and we're going to get the present value of this, which I'm just going to copy this. So we're getting the present value of our terminal value. And instead of this, we're going to change it to negative terminal value for the EBITDA uh, multiple method. So these are two different valuations. Here we're going to get the average valuation. If you had a discounted uh, dividend discount model valuation, you could take these three into account. They're within a relevant range, so I think the valuation is pretty close. And now all we have to do is divide our proposed investment by our average valuation. So we're saying at these percentages, this is how much of an investment we, we would need, or vice versa, at these dollars, this is how much we'd give up of our company based on our valuation. So the company is valued at 117 million. This is in thousands, right? This is in thousands. So this is how you perform a discounted cash flow. We started with forecasting our income statement, then going into our balance sheet and cash flows. Then we did a free cash flow um, to free cash flow our, our, um, our financial statements. Then we did our comparable company analysis. Now, you might be just given a whack or given a EBITDA multiple, um, but the way we did it is we took some public companies. In this case, we took these companies, Honeywell, Johnson, RTX, Carrier, and Eton Corporation, and we found our average weights here. Based on their information, we found the stock data uh, for the beta. And we found the EV to EBITDA to EV multiple. And then from here, we are able to come up with a average or an estimated WAC and then apply it to our valuation. We're also able to come up with an EV to EBITDA multiple. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Feel free to email me at Matthew, N-G-U-Y-E, 2023 at FAU.edu. And I hope you guys enjoyed this mini case. Take care and have a great day. So in this video, we went over how to perform a discounted cash flow, forecasting the financial statements, going to a free cash flow, then doing a discounted cash flow. We found out how to get a whack based on using some comparable companies and doing an analysis on their financials. This is not financial advice or financial help, so make sure to be cautious when you do this in practice. And like I mentioned many times in the video, a lot of times there will be some more complex financial calculations that you'll have to place. Uh, in order to do a real valuation of a company, but this is definitely a great start and a good framework for you guys to use in the future for any projects. Take care and have a great rest of your day.